now that we have uh, seen uh, how animals are uh, trained by human beings and how we derive pleasure out of uh, the way we see uh, animals behaving around us let us come to the theories okay we first come to uh, the interesting theory the first theory uh, in learning given by russian physiologist ivan pavlov what is called as classical conditioning interestingly pavlov's uh, task was not to uh, know uh, find out how animals learn he was not looking at uh, classical conditioning at all but he was basically designated uh, by the russian army uh, of conducting a research on the mechanism of digestion this was in early 1900s and for his uh, novel work uh, and the great theory that he came forward with ivan pavlov uh, received nobel prize in 1904 now what actually ivan pavlov had done was exactly what you see in this image he took a dog the dog was uh, you know fastened to belts so that he could not make uh, voluntary movements his body remains stable and then a uh, small uh, surgery was performed such that uh, the throat of the dog was connected to a tube and from that tube the saliva that was secreted by the dog would come and get collected in a beaker now you see this is the point where the surgery was performed and the actual intention was that whenever in this very plate whenever the meat powder will be presented the dog would salivate once the dog salivates the saliva that gets collected here okay will now travel from here and then get collected in the beaker there so that was uh, you know the basic uh, uh, experimentation that pavlov had designed and what he did was that every time he would present the meat powder in the bowl there the dog would salivate and every time the saliva would get collected in the beaker this is what he uh, uh, he adopted in order to understand the mechanism of digestion but then something very interesting happened in that very lab a uh, bell was also being rung for some other purpose and what pavlov observed was that initially the dog which was salivating on the presentation of the meat powder started salivating on the sound of the bell okay so somehow although it was not part of the experimental protocol although this was not the intention of the work that pavlov was doing what he realized was that the dog somehow had formed an association the association was between the meat powder and the sound of the bell and these two things got associated okay so exactly what he found was that the food is presented food is the unconditioned stimulus no you are just presenting food and there is a biological uh, mechanism okay hunger is triggered by a biological mechanism there is a process of satisfaction uh, that uh, one uh, derives out of uh, having food okay and salivation is again a biological process so the urge for having food and salivation which was basically a biological mechanism got associated okay with the sound of the bell what actually happened okay the food was presented salivation took place food is the unconditioned stimulus salivation is the unconditioned response because these are uh, biological mechanisms but then the dog what it started doing was that it associated the sound of the bell with the food it thought that every time before the food is presented the bell is definitely rung so sound of the bell got associated with the meat powder hence next time onwards whenever the bell will be uh, rung the dog used to anticipate that now definitely the food palate will come okay and this again led to salivation now salivation which was basically a biological reflex okay an unconditioned response again got conditioned to the association that was formed between the sound of the bell and the presentation of the meat powder and then next step when the, the meat powder was not provided only bell was rung still the dog used to salivate anticipating that certainly the meat powder will get presented okay and this is what ivan pavlov uh, found that the dog was classically conditioned the natural response of the dog got associated with the sound of the bell which led to an anticipatory type of a behavior now although we have uh, used this word you understand the concept let me repeat it again uh, so that you remember it better the major concepts in classical conditioning are 
unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. Okay, rest all you understand. So, a stimulus which produces response without prior learning, okay, you have not uh, learned how to respond to that very stimulus, that stimulus is the unconditioned stimulus. Okay. Food in, the, in this very experiment was the unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned response was the salivation. Okay. The dog had uh, not learned the, uh, how to respond to the unconditioned stimulus. No, it was an automatic process, it was a biological mechanism. So, salivation was the unconditioned response. Then the other two important concepts where you remove the un and therefore, it becomes conditioned stimulus, conditioned response. What is a conditioned stim, uh, stimulus? The neutral stimulus that eventually elicited conditioned response after being associated with the unconditioned stimulus. No? So, the sound of the bell and the meat powder both got associated okay? and conditioned response again remains the same, but the learnt response uh, here what is called as conditioned response is basically that occurs after the CSUS pairing has taken place. No? the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus that pairing has taken place. The unconditioned stimulus we discussed okay, in the previous slide that the unconditioned stimulus was the food. Okay. So, the conditioned stimulus would be the sound of the bell and because sound of the bell and the uh, food both got associated and therefore, the salivation which was actually initially in the first step was con considered as unconditioned response now becomes a conditioned response. So, what actually happens in classical conditioning? Basically, a neutral stimulus gets associated with a meaningful stimulus and then it acquires the capacity to elicit a similar response. Okay. Again, it is nothing but formation of association. So, classical conditioning is also associative learning and it is the substitution and association of one stimulus for the other one. Okay. So, the sound of the bell replaces uh, the meat powder, substitutes because it is associated. Okay. Now, this is actually what happens no? under normal condition, conditioned stimulus leading to no response, unconditioned stimulus leads to response. Okay. So, when the dog was not classically conditioned, even if the bell would be rung, the dog will not salivate, no dog will not respond to sound of the bell. Okay. It has there is no association between the two. So, initially sound of the bell uh, is nothing but a conditioned stimulus, but it leads to no response. Therefore, it has no meaning for the dog. What has meaning for the dog? Food has the meaning for the dog. What is food in the un, uh, in the normal condition? It is the unconditioned stimulus. Okay. And therefore, salivation was also an unconditioned response there because it is biologically programmed to salivate. During conditioning what happened? The sound of the bell and the meat powder, the food both got associated and it was this combination that led to the unconditioned response. And after conditioning took place, okay, now what was initially leading to no response, the sound of the bell, now stand alone sound of the bell can create salivation. Okay, and hence elevation becomes a conditioned response here. Okay. So, this was what uh, Pavlov uh, now found. Now, the prerequisites for classical conditioning, okay, you remember we discussed initially that contiguity, contrast and similarity, these are the three primary facilitators of learning. This is, uh, these are the factors which uh, you know, helps us form association. So, the prerequisites from classical conditioning point of view would be again contiguity and contiguity will uh, decide the degree of association. So, the conditioned stimulus okay, will lead to conditioned response which basically would develop when the interval between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus is very short. Means, the meat powder is being presented and simultaneously the bell is also rung. So, temporally the, dif the difference between the two processes which are independent Okay, the dog is not able to establish. No, it's so 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 small. But had it been a little uh, far off, you ring the bell, and after certain uh, no lapse of time, if the food was presented, the degree of association would not have been stronger because the contiguity factor was not there. So what happens? 
the more and more uh, you know, is the what you call lack of absence. Okay. So, higher is the contiguity, shorter is the period between the conditioned and the unconditioned stimulus, stronger is the bond, okay. the degree of association increases. And there have been many studies which suggest that in certain types of learning, the optimum uh, you know, duration, the gap that you can afford is just fraction of seconds. So, you can understand okay, uh, how important uh, contiguity is. The other prerequisite for classical conditioning is the contingency. Okay. Contingency basically nothing, but the predictability of the occurrence. Okay. So, that once the bell is rung, the dog would anticipate now definitely the meat powder will come. Think of our own human experience. The fact we know that whenever there is a thunderstorm, we see the light first because it travels faster compared to the sound, but the moment you see you know lightning you anticipate that you will now hear sound of the thunder. Okay. What is this? Again this is contingency, you know, this is predictability. You know that this is how nature is designed. You know that all lightning will be uh, followed by uh, the sound of the thunder. Reason being this is how it is programmed, because these two things the light and the sound they travel at different speeds. So, right from uh, you know, the space to uh, our ear it take little more time the sound takes little more time compared to light, but because we know that this is by default going to happen. So, therefore, the moment we see the light we anticipate the sound okay. and anticipating the uh, sound what we do we close our ears, because we anticipate that the sound will be uh, you know, unbearable, it will be extremely loud. You have seen the light and you close your ears, okay. this is how we respond and this is nothing but uh, the importance of contingency. And the third important factor that is the reflex. Okay. So, reflex basically the automatic response and stimulus connection that is formed, a stimulus leading to response and how automated it becomes. The more and more automated it becomes, the more faster it becomes, okay, it becomes a part of your reflex. Because of contiguity, okay, you know that if x has happened, y is by default arriving you form a very strong bond and this strong bond leads you to uh, design a response which also is extremely fast. Okay. Uh, imagine situations where you do things in a much more reflexive order. For example, you know, if you are riding okay, and you see you know, a sm smallest object coming from one side of your visual field, suddenly you would uh, try to uh, have control over the brake mechanism because you anticipate that in uh, something that is moving towards you is by default going to come very near to you and it might lead to accident. Okay. So, the three prerequisites contiguity, the first important thing uh, that we discussed, contingency the second important thing and then reflex the third important thing. These three prerequisites are there for classical conditioning to take place. Now, you can consider Pavlov's theory as a stimulus substitution theory. Okay. It can be construed that nervous system is basically structured in such a way that the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned conditioned stimulus, the bond between them, okay, they uh, know, get formed and eventually the conditioned stimulus substitutes the unconditioned stimulus. So, of course, learning takes place in the brain, there would be some chemical neurochemical signature of learning this has taken place in the nervous system and then what happens C S U S bond is formed and eventually the C S will substitute the U S. Okay. So, that why that is the reason why Pavlov's theory can also be considered as stimulus substitution theory. Now, the information theory provides explanation to the fact as to why is it that we uh, get classically conditioned. It says that the key to understanding classical conditioning is that the information an organism gets from the situation. Okay. Two important uh, people their contribution is worth mentioning here. Tolman said that the information value of the conditioned stimulus is important in telling the organism okay, what has to be followed. 
and Rescordla said that the organism as an information seeker usually uses the logic and perceptual relation among the events okay, along with the preconceptions to form the representation of the world okay. and it is this uh, information processing strategy that leads to that results into classical conditioning. Now, let us look at one question if the conditioned stimulus substitutes the unconditioned stimulus, okay, the two stimuli should produce similar response or are they supposed to uh, no, produce dissimilar uh, responses. And in this context, let us take the experiment done by uh, Kamin. What Leon Kamin did was uh, that a rat was conditioned by repeatedly pairing a tone of sound and electric shock. Now, tone of uh, the sound is the conditioned stimulus and the electric shock is the unconditioned stimulus. Okay. And this pairing was done until the tone alone produced a stronger conditioned response okay. and here of course, conditioned response would be fear. So, just like Pavlov's experiment where the sound of the bell will come and uh, the food will be presented, here the sound will be uh, given and along with sound electric shock will also be given and the rat uh, no, developed fear for it. It went to the extent that now even though electric shock was not given only the sound was generated the rat would produce fear. Now, when uh, no, Kamin started analyzing the results he found that the tone contributed to the to be paired with the shock. But when he tried to pair this with uh, the second conditioned stimulus that is light, he realized that the light when it was turned each time the tone was sounded. Okay. Uh, basically, this was again stimulus substitution, no? electric shock associated with the tone. Now, tone as well as light both are given to understand that is it that if tone is replaced by light, will light also induce similar fear. And even though the light and the shock were repeatedly paired, it was realized that the rat did not show that conditioning to light. Okay. So, the question that we were asking was that is it if that uh, conditioned stimulus substitutes the unconditioned stimulus, is it that two different type of stimuli uh, elicits similar response and Kamin's experiment uh, no, shows that no that is not true. 